show us that the entire New Testament can be broken into three uh, parts or three sections. And the first part, of course, you know, have the first, uh, the first four books, which are the four Gospels. Then we have the next part, which is from Acts to Jude. And that is uh, beside the book of Acts, the rest are typically uh, epistles written by Paul, John, Peter, and some others. Finally, we have the book of Revelation, which serves as a conclusion. Now, the importance of this chart is seen in how God is working. God works in a very, very definite way. So in the four Gospels, which are already, the time has already passed, we see that there was this God becoming flesh. He, God has become a man. And that man is Jesus Christ. But that man is also part of the Godhead. And in particular, if you look at the chart, it tells us that this God-man, this man called Jesus, is the son. And when he came to the earth, he came not only as the son of man, but he also came as a son of God. But more importantly is that when he came as a son of God, he came as the triune God too. So you may ask, how is it possible for this man, the Lord Jesus, uh, can, to come as the triune God? Well, this is a mystery, but this is what we know from the four Gospels. In particular, to the help of Brother Lee's ministry, we can see from the Greek language that this Son of God who came to earth as the Son of Man came with the Father. And it came by the Spirit because he was conceived of the Holy Spirit. So this is how the triune God moves or moved at that time. So how do we see the triune God? Well, uh, we see the triune God in the gospel as the divine trinity in this way. He came as a son of God with the Father by the Spirit. And what we can really see at that time, if we were on the earth, just like the 12 disciples, we would just see the Son of Man. That's it. But this Son of Man is the triune God. Right. Then this age has passed. The Lord Jesus right, uh, died and resurrected and became a life-giving spirit. That is what we know. But during this period, the triune God now moves. Right? And today is still moving as what? As that life-giving spirit. But this life-giving spirit that we're talking about, this spirit that we always stress, that we must uh, touch, that we must exercise, you not know, to be mingled with this spirit, we don't realize that actually this spirit is the triune God. We may just touch this spirit, just like 2,000 years ago, the disciple touched this man, Jesus Christ. But when they touched this man, actually they were touching the triune God. Likewise, starting from the uh, resurrection of the Lord, he has become the spirit. And when men touch him as the spirit, and today as we touch him as the spirit, we are actually touching the triune God. But how are we touching the triune God, when we touch the Spirit. Well, the Spirit is the Son. When we touch the Spirit, we touch the Son of God. And when we touch this Spirit, we also touch the Spirit who is with the Father. So, <clears throat> we may not realize this, but this is the Spirit who is the triune God. And why must this triune God be the Spirit who is the Son with the Father in this age? That is the question we want to cover in our classes. Right? But not only that, we also want to cover the book of Revelation uh, 
And then we must see something more that now this spirit is no longer just a spirit because in the book of Revelation, it shows us that there are the seven spirits. It's not like there are seven different spirits, but these seven spirits, uh, this term, the seven spirits, is a sign because the book of Revelation is a book of signs. So we must not take all these things literally. In the first few verses of the book of Revelation chapter 1, we saw that it says that it was given in signs. So don't interpret, or sorry, don't uh, take it literally. Seven spirits need to be interpreted. And this is the way that Brother Lee has helped us to interpret. And that is to see that this seven spirit is, now I'll use the word is because it's just a term, the seven spirits, is the sevenfold intensified spirit. And this is very interesting, all right? But we will, I will save that for later on because our lesson number 10 to lesson number 15 are concerned with this fact. So I'm not going to get into Revelation first. I want to come back to the second uh, segment of the New Testament, and that is the Acts to Jude. In particular, we will uh, not cover the book of Acts this time because actually the Acts, in the book of Acts, we see the spirit moving, no doubt, but the record in Acts are mainly records of events that can be observed by our physical eyes. It's only when we come to the epistles, starting from Romans, that we can see this spirit in its intrinsic form. Let me repeat, in the book of Acts, we can only see the spirit as shown in events that can be seen by our physical eyes. So the book of Acts is just a record of the acts of the apostles. And these acts of the apostles are outward. They can be seen by man and therefore they are written accordingly. <clears throat> so actually, you can consider the book of Acts as a witness report or witness record of all these events right, that have to do with the spirit. But that is what Luke has done. But it's not enough for our experience. For our experience, we need to get into the intrinsic view of who the Spirit is and what he's doing today. Right, so I hope you can see that this is something very deep. This is something very mysterious, yet it's something that we can experience. Maybe you will ask, and I have been asked by some saints before, that since I'm just experiencing the Spirit, why must it be so complicated that I must know the Spirit? I just touch Him. I just experience Him. I just exercise by calling on His name. And that's good enough. I touch Him. I have the reality already. So why must I get into all this what's it, intrinsic view, intrinsic knowledge of the Spirit? Well, um, I do not know uh, how you respond to that, but I will tell you this. If we love God, we will really want to know who God is. And if we want to know who God is today, we would really want to know who the Spirit is. Now, sisters, let me ask you. One day you get married. Maybe someday you'll get uh, I mean, maybe, okay, let me just say, someday you get married. Would you want to know your husband? Would you just say, oh, it's good. I, I just know him outwardly. I know that you know, he, uh, he works in this bank. You know, he, uh, he talks to me. Is that enough for you, sisters? If you have a husband like this, <laughs> that's good enough. Our events, <laughs> uh, he's a good man. <laughs> I see him come to meetings, praise the Lord. <laughs> or do you really want to get to know him? Likewise, brothers, if you have a spouse, and one day you will have a spouse, you will want to, want to know the wife right now. And uh, this is 
a universal truth. Let me tell you this is universal truth. So don't blame me <laughs> for telling you this. The universal truth is this, whether you are in the US, in the West or in the East, like Southeast Asia and so on, let me tell you, uh, brothers, you better know your wife. And you better know your wife in a deep way. I know that because I, I'm in the US now. I come across many Americans who are divorced. I come across uh, children who are, <clears throat> who come from broken families. Why? Because before marriage, they did not get to know each, the husband and wife did not get to know each other that well. And then after marriage, what happened is that they discover, oh, gee, you are so different from whom I, be, I know before. Well, then you end up with a lot of problems. And today, let me say in the same principle, many Christians, have a very superficial relationship with God. They read the Bible. They want to know the Bible. They can even talk about the Bible, but they don't know who God is. And very sadly is that today, we in the Lord's recovery, I'm not pointing fingers at others only. I want to tell you the fact about ourselves. We in the Lord's recovery. We know so many high truths. But do we really know our God? Do we really love our God? And what does it mean to love our God? Well, let me repeat. If we want to know our God, we must know the Spirit. If we want to love our God, we must love the Spirit. So this is what this uh, section from Acts to Jude tell us. And it's very important. And to know this spirit is to know the spirit as the son with the father. It is to know how this divine trinity is and does. <clears throat> All right. So with that, we will go into more details and we will cover book by book almost in the New Testament. All right. From Romans, starting from Romans, and we go all the way to John. Uh, and Jude also, a little part of Jude. From there, we will see who this spirit is, what the spirit is doing, what is this divine trinity doing today, and actually what he has been doing since resurrection. All right, are you with me so far? All right, so I, I hope uh, you can take one minute. Okay, I know that all of you are by yourself. Are you by yourself or in the group? Are you together in the training center? No. So are you by yourself? Alone? I mean, they are alone? in their respective countries. Uh, okay. But they are, they are together in one place. So in each country, they are together in one place? Yes. Okay. So, um, well, okay. If you are together in one place, I want you, I want to give, sorry, I want to give you one minute whereby each one of you one minute means I'll give you a total of two minutes. Each of you spend one minute to talk to your partner what I have just covered. Now, if you are by yourself, please speak to yourself. You know, Brother Lee, before you practice, let me just tell you something. Do you know that Brother Lee practiced that when he was in China? He told us that in China, when he was serving in China, uh, the most important time was the weekend. When you have to, when he had to release messages, weekdays, you no, know, he had to spend time contacting the saints, but mostly at night because many saints are working. So during the weekdays, when during the working hours, he prepared the messages, and this is how he prepared his messages. Not only to get the contents, but he prepared to, by speaking it, and he spoke it to the mirror. He told us he would stand in front of the mirror and practice speaking. Why? Because he's by himself. He has no partner. But that was a great help to learn to speak, to practice to speak. Don't just depend on going to the meetings and then spontaneously you speak. Those spontaneous speaking actually are not prophesying. And they are of very little value because you don't have 
the part that says in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, each one has, each one has. Right? The verse that says each one has means you must prepare yourself. And not only to prepare yourself for the contents, but like Brother Lee even, to prepare ourselves by speaking uh, before the meeting and speak to the mirror. I will also encourage you, uh, if you have a mirror, uh, just speak to yourself in the mirror. All right.